don't know if you, if you didn't get a sheet, listen, the, um, the lesson is the same as last week's. I didn't get finished. So I guess it's called part two, but whatever. Now we have gone from about 60 people here on a Wednesday night to about 30. Would, does anybody know why? Why do you think that is? Those that care are here. Hmm? Because any time that the lesson is not about you, People lose interest. Things need, those things need to change. You know, there's always a church inside of a church. There's always people who are hungry to obey God and to go, you know, even though they think it's not about them, it actually is. There's a lot of stuff we're talking about that you can apply to yourself. But I just say that because, you know, people want every service to be about them. I had a man walked into church one time. He says, what can this church do for me? I said, well, it'll give you a place to grow up. Amen. And he left. Because everything, and we, we're so accustomed to being entertained, we couldn't possibly fathom going out and preaching the gospel and helping another person. How would that benefit me? Well, you heard me say this on Sunday morning, and I want to say it again tonight, and I think it bears repeating. Though I was in Louisiana, and I was praying about, you know, the message that I was preaching, I was praying, and I was asking the Lord some, some things about my personal life in this church, and he made a statement to me. He said that the kingdom of God is about increase. Everything in the kingdom is about increase. When, when Jesus made a statement, he says, the sower sows a seed. He said, the kingdom of God is like a seed. Now, you know, most people today look at that and go, they think you're talking about tithing. Well, maybe money, but everything is about increase. Everything. When God gave man an idea to fly an airplane, the Wright brothers didn't make a 747. They learned to fly. But, but the knowledge increased. When we first started learning about telephones, Alexander Graham Bell learned how to, you know, or we learned about the telegraph, that increased. Mm -hmm. And we will increase for eternity. Amen. I know that almost sounds like, now nah, you got to hit a wall, not in God. You'll never hit a ceiling, never hit a ceiling. So God wants there to always be increase. He wants the kingdom increasing. So this is what he said to me. Are you all ready? We know y'all ever read the scripture where it says that we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ? Now we read that and often we go, uh, what's he going to say to me? And then there's the other side of the coin where Jesus did it all and we're just going to die and walk up and he's going to give us a big hug, say, I'm glad you're here. And, and that's it. And that's not, both of them are neither, are, are not right. The judgment seat of Christ, there's a, it's called the Bama seat. If you've ever watched the Olympics where they stand the people on those state, one, two, and first, second, third place, that's a, that's a Bama seat right there. That's what that is. But the Bama seat is where you answer for the fruit in your life. What did you do with what he gave you? And you're going to give an account. And I use this, this illustration. If, if I bought a car and put it on Tim's car lot... And I paid $1,000 for the car. And I said, Tim, I have a car here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy it, and I want you to sell it for you and me. I'm buying the car. You sell it. We'll both make some money. And I come back and find out that I bought it for uh, 1000 and he sold it for $1,100, but he pockets the 100 How many more cars am I going to buy him? Not very many, because I can't get him to turn me a profit. Are y'all thinking? The Lord has not done everything in your life just for you. Amen. That right there is quite a shock. He expects you to duplicate. Now, let me, let, let's, let's talk about this in a little more depth. Everything was designed by God to reproduce from corn to our children. Your children, you raised them for a reason. You raised them to get married and do the family thing again. That's why you raised them in, in the church to reproduce godly offspring. 
That means that there's going to come a day when they're going to walk an aisle, they're going to get married, and they're going to have kids. And if they just have two, the population's dying. Now, Muslims have a dozen. The French have one. The Chinese have one. Americans have two. Because we're not increasing. We've all looked at our checkbook and said, can't afford it. Just have them. Never mind. I knew y'all didn't like it. (laughs) They'll pay for themselves. It's called a workforce. Lisa often, often jokes with me, and she says, I wish we had a little girl. I need nursery workers. You know, um, but, but that's, what, that's what the kingdom, the whole kingdom operates on the word increase. Everything God gives you, he expects you to increase it. I'm going to say that again. I want you to, he gave you the new birth. He wants you to increase it. He gave you knowledge. He wants you to increase it. When he filled you with the Holy Ghost... You should not be speaking in ba 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 do do da da 25 years later. Amen. Develop the gift. If he gave you the gifts of the Spirit, develop it. If he gave you a brain, develop it. He wants every church to increase. They increase by people getting saved. Y'all look real spiritual right now. You're looking at me like a butt, like, whoo. But see, the the modern day church in America does not increase, doesn't increase, they decrease. They come in, they sit, they look, they stare, they hear, they go, and, and, and you can almost count on your finger if, if you ask people, how many people have you won the Lord? And they'll look at you and go, hey, I, I put money into Benny Hinn's offering, that's good, there's nothing wrong with that. And how many people have you actually led to the Lord? I've led hundreds. And not because I'm a pastor. I started leading people to the Lord right after I got born again because I'm a Christian. That's what Christians, Christians reproduce themselves. Now, if if you have not, don't get in condemnation, but do get under conviction. Not, wouldn't you rather hear about what's on the test here than to take the test and flunk it? Okay, good, because you're going to, you're going, God has got books, not book, books, B-O-O-K with an S on the end of the word book. There is books, the, the book of life, he goes, oh, you're in there, and he closes it, and then he goes to the next one. When you stand there, he's got books. Oh, word of life, oh, yeah, faithful. Hey, good. One people you won the Lord. Nothing. I invested the new birth, the Holy Spirit, all 20, 20, 25 years. Bad boy. <laughs> And I'll tell you, he won't be, he won't, it won't be his best day with you. And I know a lot of people think, well, that boy, that's condemnation preaching. No, it's not. It's called conviction. When I was in Tulsa and the Lord said, I said, well, what about ministry? He said, well, what about ministry? I said, I went to Ramah. He said, well, how many people have you gotten saved? I said, well, that's what I'm waiting on you for. He said, well, your boss is going to hell. I said, well, so what? You see an attitude there? I'm not interested in souls. I'm interested in a platform. And he corrected me. He said, if you don't get her saved, don't, talk, don't, don't come talk to me. You've been, you've been two years of Bible school and your boss is going to hell. Don't talk to me. Now, a lot of people don't know him very well. They, they say they know him. They don't know him. If you've been in the military, you know God. And, and, and my wife looks at me and says, you'd have been a great general. Well, that's called pastoring. Because, because we are soldiers. We're, we're not in here going, well, just, we just love you, Jesus. We just love you, Jesus. There's something. He's training you. You know, there's a scripture talking about the hundredfold return. Y'all have heard about it? it. If you go back and read the scripture, he's talking about people who've left all to follow him. He's not talking about tithing. He's talking about you putting money in an offering. 
He's talking about people who have walked away from whatever they were doing, like the rich young ruler, and have gone out and, and obeyed God. Now you say, well, I got a job. Well, good. But you can still give all. You can still give him you. Even though you are a mama and a daddy, you can give him you. Now, that means that you're giving him time more than money. Now, that's a major to people. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to get up and go off and stand on the street corner with a sign that says turn or burn, but it does mean that you and I need to start being available and, and learn how to do this thing called ministry. You're a, you are a minister. You are a minister. That's why you were born. Woo! Do you see that? Now, you might have talents. You can sing, but you're a minister. You might be a businessman, but you're a minister. You understand that? Everybody's in the ministry, okay? Not everybody's a chef, but, but everybody should learn to cook. Not everybody has a cleaning business, but you should learn to keep your house clean. Do you understand that? Not everybody's an evangelist, but everybody should learn to minister, and people should be in church because of you. Amen. What would it take to double this church? All it would take was everybody just win one person, bring them to church, you bring them, and that means that they're going to crimp your life. Because it'll be uncomfortable not being able to be a total American with another person that's relying on you to teach them the Bible. Minister to them, love on them, help them, call them on the phone. But that's all it would take. If everybody just said, well, let's, if everybody in the church just said, hey, we're all going to obey God, we'd be 500 people in a month. That's all it takes. Every person you've ever brought here except for two have gotten saved. Eh, maybe four. That's quite a number. You say, well, I, I, how come more hadn't? Well, you hadn't bring them. Y'all are awfully quiet tonight. I thought we were going <laughs> to. quit preaching and going to meddling. I am meddling. I hope you got some shoe polish because I'm all over your feet. And so, you know, when, whenever, I, whenever I say these things, let me tell you something that I'm very aware of. And I'm aware of it every day the sun comes up. There's a day that we're all going to stand before the Lord. I, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of it, but I am preparing for it. When I was in school, I always got a stomach ache when it was test day. Now, my mother learned that it was acid from worry because I was out playing baseball and not studying. And so I went and, and took the test, and I won't tell you what I made on some of them. And that meant that I had to stay after school and stay with the teacher until I learned the material. Because I liked to goof off when I was a kid. Well, that didn't change for some people. Okay, never mind. Y'all y'all see this? So he is, he is asking us to get busy with this book. Get real serious about it. He's real serious about it. When he says, now go to Mark 16 with me again. Go to Mark 16. Now I started off by saying there's only 30 something people in here. We started off with 60. 30 people are busy doing nothing. Your house, your car, your whatever you're doing, when you die, won't want to amount to a hill of beans. Won't amount to anything. So there is a natural side and there is a spiritual side. But all that's going to matter when you die is fruit. That's all that's going to matter. At the end of the year, when the man that owns your business walks in it and he says, I want to see your books, and he brings an accountant, he wants to see that you made him a profit. He hired you. He's paying you a salary. He wants to see a profit. Now, if there's a good profit, then you get a cut of it. Everybody wants a cut of it. But if it's not making money, you remember the story that he told about the guy that had the tree that never bore fruit. Now, if for y'all to understand this, and I, I like all the help I can get, I just planted four new citrus trees, three new fig trees, and uh, 10 new squash plants today. So listen, I, 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 the reason that I cut all of my orange trees down, I cut them all down. 
they didn't produce me fruit. And I gave them, I, I fertilized them, and I gave them a year. And I think they're probably 30, 40 years old. I don't know, they're old trees. And so I went out with my chainsaw. The trees are now in the firewood pile. And I have all new trees out there because I want orange juice and I want grapefruit juice. I want, I want fruit. Am I okay with that? That's why I planted them. You are the garden of God. He planted you for purpose. He wants fruit. He will be coming around looking at you going, well, what are you doing? Well, I've been busy. Yeah, yeah, well, the wrong thing. You can tell me that. Don't tell him that. Are y'all okay? So tonight you can go, oh, help us, Jesus. That's fine with me. I don't mind. But be aware that uh, one glad morning when this life is over, I'm going to fly away. That'll be a good day. Then I'm going to stand before the Lord as I say, hello, how's the church? And I'm going to go, thou knowest. And he goes, well, let's open the books. How'd you do? Sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Okay. But I'm aware that I have to give an account of what I did. I got to give an account of y'all's tithes. So don't, you don't worry about me stealing your money. You don't scare me. He does. He scares. He scales me. <laughs> so I don't steal his tithes. They pay me a salary and anything else you give goes to this church. And we give and we put a lot of it in the, in, back in the church. And, and, and we turn away uh, raises all the time just because I got to give an account. If you think this way, your life will change. When I worked construction, I won everybody that I worked with to the Lord, or I, met, I gave them every opportunity in the world to get saved. Everybody I have ever worked with since the day I got born again, I have talked to extensively about the Lord. Everybody, bar none. I pray, oh God, open up a door and let me sit and talk to him. And he does. He opens up doors. And everywhere I go, all the time, I walk out of this church, I, I take off pastor hat, and I put on Christian hat, just like you do. And I become a Christian, just like you. And I go out and I do exactly, I do what I teach you to do. Do you see that? Okay. There's a word in American English that we don't like. It's called responsibility. Oh, y'all are exciting. To me. The American public has got everybody in the world blaming for their life but themselves. My grades are not my fault. They're my parents. It's the home I grew up in. It's no, it's, it's, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's tough. But it's you. It's me. And, and once, we, once we realize that, we go, I could learn this if I really wanted to. Yeah, you could. You can do anything you want to do, and you do. When a person looks at me and says, Pastor, I can't, I'm gonna, I'll be honest with you. I, I look at your forehead, and I wrote the word on it, won't. Because you can do Anything God told you, you can do. You say, well, I was busy. Well, then trim some stuff. Trim the tree. Prune it. I prune, I prune trees too. I, I prune good trees. Anyway, are you all in Mark? This will be good tonight. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And he wasn't talking to just the apostles. He's talking to the church. And he who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs follow those that believe, we talked about last week, that believe in my name. They will cast out devils, they'll speak with new tongues, 
They'll take serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it'll by no means hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of God, and they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs accompanying. They had jobs, too. All right. Now, he sat down waiting because he finished his job, and yours began. He finished his. He's now representing you at heaven. And now you're representing him here. We've taken his place. The church took his place. That's what we're here for. When you read the Bible, that's what we are doing. Now, um, I want to read Matthew 28. So go over there because this is the other scripture where he is, uh, he is given a final statement to the disciples, to the church before he goes away. You understand this is the last thing he said. And this is probably one of the most important things he ever said, or this is the touche of his whole life. He's talking to the church. And they went out and, well, go to, I didn't give you that. I'm sorry. Go ahead and go to Matthew 28. If you can pop it on the screen. If not, I did not give that to Betty and my apologies. Matthew 28, when the 11 disciples went away, that's verse um, 16. To the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them, and they saw him there, and they worshiped him, and some doubted. And Jesus came, and he spoke to them, and he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe all things I commanded. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That means he didn't back it away. Now, in the next statement that we're going to talk about, he makes a statement. He says, all authority. All authority. How much? All. all of it. Now, no matter what you see on the news, no matter what you hear, all authority in heaven and hell has been given to the man, Jesus. He rules. He's the boss. And that means that because of that, all spirit beings recognize he is now the boss. Now, do you remember in the, in the, the, when Jesus was in the wilderness and Satan said, if you bow all this authority, I will give you. Because he had it. It was, it was a real temptation. If it hadn't have been a temptation, then Jesus was part of a farce. He was part, he's, he gave the indication that that was a temptation, but he had it wasn't because Satan didn't really have it. Satan did have it. He took it from Adam. Now, the reason that is in there, because that was a temptation to Jesus. Why would all authority be a temptation to Jesus? Because he wanted it. That's why he came. Now, think about that for a minute. Let's stop. He is, he is wanting the authority that Satan has, but, but he needed to obey God and get it God's way. And once he got it, and he did get it, and he went into hell in the region of the damned, and he stripped Satan of all authority, that means that he has all authority. Now, when we talk about the name Jesus, anytime we mention someone's name, that name is no bigger than the authority behind it. If you are the CEO of a lemonade stand and you have all authority over the nickels in the cup, that's still all authority, but it's only 15 cents. So you have authority, but not over much. All right. Now, when Jesus says all authority was given to me, that all in heaven and earth, that means everything, he all in heaven, all in the earth, and all down in hell. That means his name rules everything. Now, when you hear that, you go, oh, oh. And then he said, now I'm going to give you my name because you can't get the job done without it. Now, the church today has almost zero knowledge of what I just said. Maybe one in a thousand ever even heard what I just said. They will pray, oh, let's pray to Jesus. You don't pray to Jesus. 
Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. He's the mediator between you and God the Father. You pray to the Father in his name because you're not recognized there. They don't know anything about Daryl. Daryl? Do we know Daryl? I don't think so. Well, he loves me. I'm sure he does, Daryl. Well, I came in here in the name of Jesus. Oh, 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 oh. Come on in. Oh, you should have said so. You, oh, you represent him? Yeah, well, what, what do you want? That, 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 that makes what this a complete legal, a legal thing. Now, let me make another statement here. This is a legal document. It's covenant. You have a document at home. It's, it's your, it's a, when you bought a house, they gave you a contract, and especially if you've paid it off, if you have a title deed, that's, that's a legal document. It's yours. Now, the thing that the church has had a hard time with is that faith always presents God with the legal documents. He ain't interested in anything in, on the legal document. If it's, if it's in here and it's yours legally, then you have a right to it in the name. But, you, but if you don't know it's yours, oh, let, me, let me give you another example. Walk in the bank and just, just, I mean, just walk in the bank and walk up to the teller and say, I want $100. And she'll ask you for a number, won't she? Who are you? Well, I'm Tanya. Hi, Tanya. Uh, what's your number? Oh, I, I just want some money. I know, Tanya. But we love you. You're cute. And, and, we, and we know you're, and you're, and you're sweet. And, I, and you say you have money, but what's your number? They could care less whether you cry, wallow, throw a fit, or offer them lemonade. Until you give them a number, they're not going to give you even if it's your money. It's legal. And, and that's what, quote, unquote, when you hear the faith message, oh, I suppose name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, paper. <laughs> well, that's also why you don't ever see any healings in their church or people born again. Because there's a legal side to this other than the fact that Jesus loves you, this I know. You need to approach God legally. You need to approach every demon in hell legally. You need to approach everything on the earth legally. Everything bows to the name of Jesus. Jesus is bigger than cancer. Jesus is bigger than, than demons. Jesus is bigger than everything. Do you understand that? So when you start, when you start thinking like this, you go... Now, where was that book? Okay. Are y'all seeing this? Okay. Are y'all ready? Because I'm going to read. Um, several years ago, this is E.W. Kenyon. Uh, he's going on to be with the Lord probably back in the 50s, I think. I was holding a meeting in a city in Tennessee, and one afternoon while giving an, ad an address on the name of Jesus, a lawyer interrupted me. Say legal. Do you mean to say that Jesus gave us the power of attorney and the legal right to use his name? I said to him, brother, you're the lawyer. I'm only a layman. You tell me, did Jesus give us the power of attorney? And he said, well, if language means anything, Jesus gave the church power of attorney. Now let's stop for a minute because there, T Tanya knows what I'm talking about and Tim knows what I'm talking about, but maybe a few of you do not. If you go and say, uh, I'm going to buy a car this afternoon, and, and, and I'm there to sign the papers, they'll look at you and they'll say, well, wait a minute. And I, and I look at Lisa and say, I got to leave, and I got to go back to work. Then the man's going to pull out a document, and he's going to say, would you sign and give me the power of attorney to finish the transaction today? And we'll take care of your truck and we'll have it ready for you. That actually happened. 
And I said, I will. And I, and I filled out a paperwork and I gave him the power to act in my place and to finish the documents and get my truck ready. But yet, if I wasn't there, he couldn't do that. He's not buying the truck. I'm buying the truck. So the power of attorney is the ability to act in someone else's place when they're not present. That is what he meant when he said, go into all the world and in my name. He's asking you to deal with demons. You're no match for a demon. They will eat your lunch and spit you out. One demon could pick you up and flick you like a booger on a windshield. Let's just get honest about it. I know you're a booger on the windshield. I know a lot of people running around talking about how big and bad you are, but let me tell you something. One angel in the Bible, one angel killed 185,000 men one night. That's just one angel. You know, when, you know I, I, that book, 23 Minutes, when people die, I wonder if they have any idea what's coming. Because the demons are going to beat the stuffings out of you forever. <laughs> You're thinking, yeah, we're going to go down and have a party. If people knew that, they would run to churches, get up here, and not move until they're saved. And they think, oh, well, we're all going to hell. We're all going to have a party. And the demons are going, that's right, come on. We're going to have a party with you. Now, that's a heavy statement. You can't handle demons. You can't handle sin. You can't handle sickness. You can't handle death. You can't handle any of it. But Jesus did. And that name is as powerful as he is. And that he handed to every person to get a job done that without it is not even remotely possible. All right, let me give you another illustration. The United States government's asked men to step out on the interstate and to stop traffic. Now, once he gets on a uniform, he steps out and there's semis coming down the road. And he goes, and they go, whoa, and stop. And if that semi had no respect for him, it would be, Splat, boom, boom. And down the road, the semi would go. So when you're standing there going, hey, devil, he's going, splat, boom, boom, down the road. And you go, Jesus, he goes, oh, boom. We all see this. Now, that's what that name means. That's what this is all about. The early church knew this. And without it, you're not going to get anybody born again. You're not going to get them saved. You're not going to get them delivered. You're not even going to help them. Because most of the people you know are so bound up by demons. Unless somebody comes and sets them free, they're not going to get free. As a matter of fact, if they're harassing you, they're not, gonna, they're, they're not leaving because you had a bad day. Now, let me stop right here and stop preaching on the name of Jesus. Let me just minister to you for a minute. I'm going to be a demon for just a minute. Let me tell you something. You're sorry, a worthless dog. If you think God loves you, he could care less about you. He doesn't even like you. Now, if I were you, I wouldn't even bother going to that meeting because you're just a piece of crap. Do you understand me? I mean, you have never done anything right. You never will do anything right. And you're stupid. You're just stupid. You understand? You're just stupid. Anybody in here ever heard this? Not only that, but the people in the church don't even like you. And all the money you've been putting in there, the pastor's been stealing it anyway. <laughs> the air around you every day is full of devils. And you're dealing with them in your soul and your mind and they're like gnats. And the most church people come in. Well, just shut up and just worship God and use the name. 
Because the de- devils have zero mercy. They, they're not a tiny bit good. They are zero. If you want to know what it's like to be in a horde of demons, then go to Afghanistan. And walk down the street and go, we just love you. They just kill you and look at you. They're crazy because they're full of the devil. I think we just just should get along with them. I don't. I think we ought to just ship every devil out of this country. Burn their moss down and turn pigs loose in them. Every one of them. But again, everybody else doesn't have that much sense. Everybody you know who's not saved is bound by the devil. Or they'd be saved. Let me say it again. Everybody you know that's not walking with God is bound by the devil. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, that's why he said, go in my name and cast out devils. He's not talking about going to Honduras and somebody slithers up like a snake and barks like a dog. He's talking about your family. He's talking about your relatives that are coming this weekend and aren't coming to church. He's talking about all the knuckleheads that, that aren't reading their Bible and that, that are hollering at you and think you're crazy because you speak in tongues. Those are the people that he's talking about. They're full of the devil. Or they'd be serving the Lord. If they're not in love with Jesus, they're full of the devil. There is no in-between. Are you all okay with all this? So you say, well, who do I talk to? Everybody not in here. (laughs) Do y'all get this? Do you see that we have work to do? Okay. Now, once you learn this, you go, Wow, I didn't know I could go out and start setting people free. Yeah, because Satan does not want you to know this. He would rather you be somewhere else than tonight hearing this. Because once you hear this, you go, I did not know that now I can boss the devil around. He doesn't care what you do as a Christian. But whatever, if you ever pick up the book called The Authority of the Believer, now you'll scare the heebie-jeebies out of him. Especially if you read it and do it. Because he wants to bind people and he wants to illegally bind them. And he certainly doesn't want you to ever exercise authority. I was talking to a man the other day and he was talking about what's coming in America. And he asked a man who is quote unquote a patriot. He says, what are you going to do if if stuff breaks out in America? He said, well, I guess the first thing we should do is start shooting the cops. And this man looked at him and said, well, you idiot. That's the only thing we've got to keep peace in this city. You, you, you got to have the cops, you dumb thing. You know, shoot the cops. All right, if that's true, what would happen if all of a sudden all the cops were gone? Anarchy. Well, what would happen if Christians suddenly quit using the name? Anarchy. And what do we have in America? Anarchy. I don't know who you're voting for. I don't do. I have a day while I really want. Oh, help me, Jesus. It isn't, ain't nobody in Washington knows anything I'm talking about. Well, there might be a few senators in there that know, and they're in there praying. They're walking through the halls praying, amen. There's a few in there that do. They do. And there's people in this, this country that love God. And what's happening in America is that we're starting to wake up and go, I don't like this country. Well, the pilgrims came here because there was a new land. But there's no place for you to get on a boat and go. So you might want to preserve this one. Just a thought. I know you want to run and hide. How am I doing, okay? One, two, ten. One, two, eight, six, four, two. Okay. All right. When we pray, we take Jesus' place here to carry out his will. And he takes our place before the Father. He said that it should not only cover our prayer life, the name, but it would also be used in combat against the unseen forces that are surrounding us every day. That's what the name is for. You can tell there's a difference between being Christian and religious, can't you? Okay. I love kumbaya, but that won't cut it. All right.
We have a conviction that before Jesus returns to this earth, there's going to be a mighty army of believers who will learn the secret of living in the name, of reigning in life, of living the victorious, transcendent, resurrection life of the Son of God among men. There will be a group of people on the earth that will be full of God, know who they are in Christ, and will turn the world upside down. There will be a group of people that will do that. There are men who are assigned to the age to teach the body of Christ how to do that. I know one of those guys. He pastors in uh, Popka. I'm going to be honest with you. That's a mandate that's been on my life since I started. To teach you who you are and what belongs to you. That's why this church is way different than all the other ones you go to. And they're all good. Good ain't God. And they're, and they're God, God. They're not God. They're good. They're good. It's a good place to sing kumbaya. Now, they love Jesus. There are they're, they're some good churches out there. If our minds could only grasp the fact that Satan is paralyzed, he has been stripped of all of his armor by the Lord Jesus Christ, that disease and sickness are servants of the man, and that, at his, and that his voice they must depart, it would be easy to live the, in the resurrection realm. All right, let's paint a picture. We have a man ruling the earth with no armor, not a drop. Do you remember the Wizard of Oz? Someone, I know y'all remember. Do you remember the big smoking head? It was just a little guy. All right, so Satan rules this earth with lies. That's all. All of the bondage going on in your life right this minute is a bondage because of a lie. Now, once you pick up, once you pick up your Bible and once you walk into church and you learn the truth, the enemy is not in this room in flesh and blood. He, that he's not your next door neighbor and you're not married to him. And he's not the pastor. The enemy is the devil. Okay, now, now th that, that's a revelation to a lot of Christians, that the enemy is the devil, and he's a liar, and if you listen to him, he will drag you into bondage. All of your depression, all of your sad days, because you listened to a lie. Nobody made you sad. Circumstances didn't make you sad. You listened to a lie. You didn't open your Bible. You didn't believe what the Bible said. You went by your emotions. You went by your feelings. You went by something somebody said. And then you walked out mad and hurt and frustrated because some demon told you a lie and got your feathers ruffled. And you went home and sat and pouted until you died. That's all that's happening. But he has no ability to keep you bound. Jesus said you'd know the truth, and the truth would set you free. Once you find out, I've been made righteous. You're the righteousness of God. He loves you with the same love he loves Jesus. He fills you with the Holy Ghost. He fills you with his life. He wrote your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. He gave you the name that's above every name. And the greater one lives inside of you. You go, whoo! Now, the reason that there's anarchy in a city is because the police make no arrest. Now, every place in the city I've ever gotten a ticket, every place, I can tell you where they are. And when I drive by them, I slow down. I drive, I mean, there's a place by Bear Lake. It's the speed limit's 25. I hate that road. It's the road going to Art and Crystal's house. I hate that road, that road. That road coming from the Wawa up there. It's 25 miles an hour. And I found out that it's not 45. And I think 45 is not fast. But the cop that gave me a $200 ticket decided that 25 was the speed limit. It's on a sign. It's on the sign. But I didn't think about the sign. Now, once he gave me the ticket, I've never sped down that road again. I don't. Now, 
The reason why we obey the law is because there's police. That's why. Now, once the church starts rising up and starts walking in their house and go, well, there'll be no drugs in this house in the name of Jesus. And there'll be no rebellion in this. And there will be no adultery. And there will be no lust in this house in the name of Jesus. And there will be no confusion in this house in the name of Jesus. I won't have it. Now, I'm not talking about you talking to your kids. I'm talking about you talking to the spirit behind your kids. Now, there's not anything wrong with you talking when you turn the idiot tube off either. Because it's coming out of it. We don't, we don't watch on a lot of TV. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you don't watch TV. I'm just going to tell you to watch what you watch. Yes. And about the time they gd and and m and f and flip it, just turn the sucker off. I have to put up, just shut up. And I, I do talk to the drug commercials every time one comes on. You foul devil from hell, I bind you. You foul thing in the name of Jesus. And we go back to our movie, and then we got another drug commercial. I bind you, foul, pharmaceutical devil in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I drive down the road, and I drive by these palm places. I just stop and go, Shandai, Haralaba, Shana, I bind you, foul devil from hell in the name of Jesus. Oh, you, ought not, you don't want to ride around town with me. I, I just <laughs> put up with a lot of mess. Amen. We take the name and clean the house out quite often. Clean this church out every once in a while, walk around and all you devils leave. Sometimes they take people with them, but that's okay. No, I I didn't mean to say that. Please forgive me. (laughs) Are y'all getting this? Now we're just, we're just on one word. I mean, this is powerful. We could study this for weeks and months and not scratch it. That's how much is in here. And the average church member doesn't know anything. I wish they did. I really wish they did. That's one of the reasons why I'm doing this, because this is actually going on the Internet, and there's a, there are people way outside this church already taking this class. I'm talking about in Virginia and Tampa and different places. They're already downloading and getting the papers and going to school. Amen. It was kind of the way I went, the design of it. Okay. Oh, I got to skip that one. We'll come back there. We have to skip that one too and come back there. I read this last week and I'm going to read it again. In my own ministry for years, I found a great deal of, of trouble that perhaps every preacher or evangelist finds with certain types of people. Notice he said people who are always trying and never seeming to get settled in God. Now, y'all, y'all, right now your brain's going to start thinking of people in your family, and this is so. They're always standing up for prayers, but they never seem to get any further. Another class that really seems to get the light, but they're held by an, some kind of an unseen power. These people naturally caused me a great deal of trouble. I wondered how I could help them, and one day I was strangely led beyond myself to command the unseen power broken over a person in whom he was holding. I prayed in the name of Jesus. I cried, in the name of Jesus, I command power broken over this person's life. Instantly, that person was delivered, and I stood amazed at the effect. A strange fear came over me that I had been able to exercise by the simple command in Jesus' name, the marvelous power, and since that time, I have seen many startling results in revival services through using the name of Jesus. I found that the reason many people do not accept Jesus as their Savior was because they were held by the power of demons. The people are hungry. They want deliverance from sin. They crave eternal life, but they're unable. 
many of them to break loose from the bonds that hold them. Hundreds of people have said to me, I cannot become a Christian. I want to, but something holds me. I have simply laid my hands on their shoulder and I said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, I command the power that holds you broken and in the mighty name, get on your feet. And with tears of joy, they have obeyed. I have prayed with men who were held by habits, tobacco, liquor, lust, and in the mighty name of Jesus, I've seen them delivered usually instantly. I found Christians who were unable to testify or lead in prayer in public meetings, who felt their mouths were closed and their hearts cried for liberty. I have scarcely met a case in whom I have prayed in the name over them and commanded the power broken that I have not seen immediate deliverance. Now, isn't that amazing? Now, you're talking to people, and you're arguing with them for hours trying to get through their head, and you don't realize there's a, there's a spirit binding them up, and you don't have to sit and argue with them for hours. Listen, as a Christian, you can be happy all the time. You don't have to, you don't have to struggle and, and I'm not talking about walking around the house doing war with the devil and looking sad. I don't want you to walk around acting like a military general in your house. I bind every devil. I worked for a man one time and uh, he was a born again Christian, but he had, uh, you know, you can yield to the devil. People, Christians can yield to the devil. You know that. And one day I was working for him and he was ranting and raving. I mean, like a maniac, just, just off the, and it wasn't, I mean, there's times he got upset because of our work. And I understand that he had a, that's flesh, but this wasn't just flesh. This, this just, he's just walking around aggravated just to be aggravated. And he's just fussing him. And I'm over there trying to work. And I just said, I'll shut up in the name of Jesus. And I mean, it looked like he hit a brick wall. And the guy I was with was also a Christian, and he went, well, that worked. <laughs> and he heard him say it, and he went, what worked? And he went back to ranting and raving, and I said, the first was devil, that's just flesh. <laughs> now, there, there's time. You don't, you just, just take over the room. Just walk in and go, in the name of Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you all something. And th- now, I'm not, I'm not talking about me. Because what I'm going to tell you works for everybody that will do it. I have been in buildings where no one knows me. I don't know who I am. I walk in, I sit down, and somebody will walk up and go, who are you? And I go, why do you ask? And they go, I don't know. Do you own the place? I go, well, no. I was on an airplane going overseas. And I walked in, sat on the airplane. Now, I'm talking about walking in authority. Stewardess walks up to me and goes, hello. And I went, hello. And she looks at me and she goes, are you comfortable? I said, well, no. She goes, well, we have a seat up here with more leg room. And I said, would you like it? And I said, I would. And so she, she pulls me out of my seat and takes me up to that seat with the leg room, puts me down in it. I said, thank you. And she goes, who are you? And I went, oh. I said, no, I can't tell you that. She goes, oh. Can I get you anything? I said, yes, I'd like some coffee. I'll be right back. She went into first class all night and stole food. (laughs) And Lisa's sitting in the back. She wouldn't come up. And she's going, you know, what are you doing I said, hush. It's called favor. Won't you come up here? She goes, I ain't come here to sit with you. You got that woman eating out of your hand. What are you doing to her? I said, I ain't doing anything to her. She goes, I know. Now, what did I, what, what did I do to her? I didn't do anything to her. But there is, there is an authority that we walk in. We, we are somebody. And the world, they can see the glory of God on us. And they'll often look, and I used to work construction, and they'd walk up and hand me the papers to sign. Everybody gave me the papers to sign. 
And Randy Weber came to me one day and snatched it. What are you doing with that? That's not yours to sign. That's mine to sign. I'm the boss. And I said, ah, Randy, I didn't tell him to give it to me. Well, they always give it to you. I'm, you don't own the place. I do. Now, if he owns the place, what's he fighting with me for? <laughs> yeah, because I do own the place. Do y'all see that? This is powerful once you learn this. Every demon in hell knows who you are. Now, that's, 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 that's a good thought. When you walk in the room, they go, hmm, I wonder how they're doing. The, the, the reason that they make your, the reason they bother you is to get your eyes off of this and on the problem so you'll stop walking in authority. That's the, if you're going through hell right now, it's the best compliment you ever went through in your life because there's something about you he's trying to stop. Use the name. Just don't cry about it. Use the name. Okay, we're running out of time, and I haven't even gotten the second verse yet. Well, y'all getting this? Are you learning this? Okay. Is this good? All right. Um. There's more. I think there's another one here. Okay. That's, I think that's all I marked in this book. There's tons of stuff in the book. Now, I'm going to read one more story to you. This is the story of Kenneth Hagin when the Lord started teaching him about demons. Uh, Kenneth Hagin, I think the Lord appeared to him 10, 11, 12 times in his life. This one, he, he sat and talked to him for over an hour and a half about demons and demon possession and because the earth, the world just really doesn't know a lot about demons and devils, especially the denominational church. They just, yeah. Everything happens good and bad is God, whatever God, that kind of thing. So, so here, I want you to, as I read the story, it's very good. There was a third part of the 1952 vision about demons and evil spirits and how to deal with them. In the third part of the vision, Jesus gave me a further instruction on how to deal with demons Here's what happened. As Jesus was talking to me in the vision, all of a sudden, a demon ran up between us. It looked a lot like a monkey, but his face was more human looking. The demon ran between me and Jesus and began to jump up and down in the air. And as he did, he put something like a black cloud or a smoke screen. And when he did that, it became hard to see Jesus. And then the little imp began to jump up and down and throw his arms and said, yakety, 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 in a high-pitched shrill and scream. All right, now, y'all, have y'all ever had to where you couldn't hear God and there was nothing but just confusion, confusion, confusion around you? Now you know what it is. Don't, don't, it's not you. Well, when you start hearing accusations against you to yourself, you're dealing with a spirit. And you're going to deal with it. You, you need to talk to him. Okay. The entire time this was happening, Jesus went right on talking. I could hear Jesus talking. I couldn't distinguish anything he said. And because of that smoke screen, I couldn't even see Jesus anymore. That probably lasted only a few seconds, but it seemed like many minutes to me. I thought to myself, doesn't Jesus know I can't hear him, what he's saying? Doesn't he know I'm not getting what he's saying? And then I thought, why didn't he, why didn't he tell him to stop? Why didn't he do something about this? I can't hear him. Finally, in desperation without even really thinking. I just pointed my finger at that little demon. I said, I command you to stop in the name of Jesus. When I said that word, that little demon hit the floor, kerplop. The black cloud disappeared and he lay on the floor shaking and trembling just like a little whip puppy. He started crying and whining. Jesus looked at him and then he looked at me and he pointed to the little demon and he said, well, if you hadn't done something about that, I couldn't have. Now, that'll throw your doctrine off. If you're a denominational Christian, that will mess your head up. Do you remember in Mark 6, 5, Jesus could do nobody work in his own hometown? All authority was given to Jesus. He's the head. Where's the body? That's us. All right. He gave us our dominion back. He never told anywhere in the Bible for you to ask God to do something about the devil. Nothing in your Bible nothing anywhere in your Bible says for you to ask God to deal with the devil. You deal with it or it just goes on.
Because you're allowing it. Yeah, I just wanted y'all to think a minute because, you know, it's hard to get water through concrete. Just, just let it sit there a little while. As Jesus looked at him anyway, and I said, Lord, I know I misunderstood you. You didn't say, if I hadn't done something about that demon, you couldn't have. You said you wouldn't have. He pointed at the demon, laid tremble on the floor, and he said, no. If, I hadn't, if you hadn't have done something about that evil spirit, I couldn't have. Now, he went on to argue with the Lord until the Lord explained to him about his false, doc, false sovereignty doctrine. Now, now, stop and think about this. We're reading the scripture, Mark 16, go into all the world, and in my name cast out devils. Mm-hmm. That's not just a cute scripture. No. That's, that's life. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's every day. And I'm not talking about people possessed. I'm just talking about the fact that he, he is ruling illegally only because no one's told him to stop. That's the only reason he's ruling. Now, if he, you tell him to stop me, does it's flesh, take the kids in the back room, get the paddle out. While we're on the subject, let's talk about kids. Why do you discipline them? To teach them. To resist the devil. If, if they are growing up wild, you didn't discipline them. Well, we love our children. Well, then discipline them. Teach them to say no to, every, to the thoughts that hit their head that are not God. We have parents in this church right now. If, if their moms and dad had spanked them, never mind. Just as I was going to close with this, Philippians chapter 2. We're not even done yet. Are you all ready for name of Jesus part 3? Okay. Is this, is this, does this help your soul right now? I'm going over this a lot, over this a lot. Norville Hayes made a statement. Somebody came up to him one time and said, you still believe there's a demon under every bush? And he goes, no, I don't believe there's a demon under every bush. He said, I haven't believed that in years. He said, I believe there's two demons under every bush. <laughs> now, you see, once you learn this, don't become depressed and become a demon chaser. Just use the name and realize you're in authority and your word means what it says. You don't have to jump up and down and scream and, and, and spit. Policemen can still write a ticket and talk to you nice. I had one do it one time. It really made me mad. He was so nice. He pulled up and he says, Mr. Morgan, how are you doing? I said, really good. And he said, did you not see the 45 sign? I said, you mean five miles back? He said, that one. I said, yeah, we're not even in the city. But I've been looking for it and I missed it. It's in Tennessee. And they do it on purpose. Oh, yeah, they do. It's 45, and you're a mile or two outside of town, and they're just waiting on you because I'm looking for town. Y'all, look, y'all, y'all don't look at me in that tone of voice. Gary used to be a police officer. He understands this whole thing. Well, by time, no, it, was, no, it went from 65 to 55, and then when you get into town, it's 45. That's right. So I saw the 45 one, and I went, that means I missed the 55 when I was still doing 65 plus grace. I was doing 69 is what I'm doing. I got a cruise control set on 69, and, I, and I'm in, in a 55, and I'm approaching the 45 doing 69, and I see a whoo, and I looked, and I said, I'm not even at the 45. I wonder if I passed the 55. I looked at my GPS, and it said yes. So he pulls it. He was so kind. He was nice, called me Mr. Morgan, and wrote me a ticket anyway. And it just made me mad as a hot cake. He didn't get mad or angry or nothing. You don't, you don't have to throw a fit to be an authority. Let's, let's, let's get off this for just a second and talk about your children. You do not have to scream. To, if You can look at them real kindly and go, no, I said you're not going to go. 
and you are going to, you know, I, I, I know, I said so. I love you. Come here, give me a big hug. No. I will the fire out of you. No. Okay. You understand? You, you don't, why do we feel like that until we scream, we, our words don't mean anything? Truth is truth whether you're ranting or raving or not. You're ranting and raving because you don't even believe your own words. I'm out of time, but let's read this. Are you all ready? I just want to read this one. And, and so we have something to start with next time. Philippians 2.5. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. He made himself no reputation, but he took on the form of a bondservant, and he came in the likeness of men. Now, he walked the earth as a man, left his deity behind. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. Now, listen to this. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on the earth and those under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's not talking about when you die. He's not talking about in the sweet by and by. He's talking about right this minute. Everything in the universe is subject to the name. Even animals, storms, tornadoes, hurricanes. I don't care what it is. It's all subject to the name of Jesus. Your business, money is subject to the name. I know you're going, you can say hallelujah anytime you want to. This is awesome. Isn't this good? Isn't this awesome? All right. This is a powerful truth and won't do you a bit of good if you don't start pay, if you don't get your Bible out and start doing some study because he made one statement. These signs follow those that believe in the name. You need to start believing in this. You, you need to have a good working knowledge of what I just said. You need to know this well. This is life or death, sink or swim. For many people. But once people, John Wesley went back and forth across the ocean many times in vessels. He said, he's a Methodist preacher. I never approached a storm that I didn't step on the bow and command it to stop. And it did. Now when you've got to be in a ship and you're in the ocean and it's just a piece of wood. The Atlantic Ocean is a big ocean for a wooden boat, a big rowboat. And that's what they went back and forth over. Airplanes, boats, cars, traffic, I don't care what it is out there today, is subject to the name. All authority has been given to me. You go in my name, and then you you, you should go, "Oh, oh my God, yeah, I can do this. I can do this. Yeah, you can. That's probably one of the most powerful things you'll ever learn about helping and setting people free. They're not as bad as you think. They're, but many of them are very, very ignorant. Use the name. Help them out. Amen? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the opportunity to share this word. We covered something tonight very, very powerful. And I pray that we would, 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 would grow in this and learn it. Learn to walk in the light of this. I believe in the days we're in, we're going to need it. We're going to need a lot more of this than we've ever done in our life and be more conscious of who we are and what belongs to us. We're your sons and we're your daughters and we're our Christians and heaven is our home. But while we're down here, we have work. We have people around us every day. And we've learned a truth tonight. Holy Spirit, I commit this word of truth into the minds and the hearts of the people that are in here that we'll go out of here and begin using this truth and watch you set people free and we give you praise for it in Jesus name everybody said